look like that I'm standing up here stalling, trying to figure out what to do. And the answer is, you're right. I'll tell you the truth, Rabbi Tai. I've spoken about nine places in the last 48 hours here in Miami. And I knew that the Kolel was the last stop. And I said to myself, let me find out because, you know, in different communities, the understanding of what a Kolel looks like and what the people that make it up varies depending on the community. So I'm thinking to myself, Kolel. So I sat down and I actually prepared to share as we would give, Sheer Chloe style, of course. And I said to myself, I'm going to a kail. I mean, what else are you going to deliver? But then they told me, no, no, no. The kolel wants to hear inspiration. I said, oh, it's that type of kolel. It's a community kolel. Uh-huh. OK, so I sat down, and I started coming up with a drasha of inspiration. And then I walked in tonight, and I'm looking around the room, and I'm thinking, What a hush of a cut. Monday afternoon, I got on JetBlue's finest, flight 1601, at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, thinking that the flight down to Miami would be 2 hours and 35 minutes. I got on the plane at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. I landed in FLL at 8.35 p.m. Close to eight hours on that flight. And I figured to myself, you know, toss up another two hours, I could have went to Yerushalayim. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I realized from the first moment of this trip that if there is such a resistance on coming down here, there must be something very special waiting. There's no way that this trip is just going to be an ordinary trip. Why is he fighting me so much? Why is he fighting? What does he want from this trip? Really? Could you imagine? You get on a plane at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Could you imagine that you're sitting down and JetBlue announces that the flight plan doesn't match the passenger list and somehow or other that the computers aren't talking to each other. And now they don't know mi va mi ha holichim. This was Wait, wait. They don't know mi va mi ha holichim. So listen to this. JetBlue, they bring on their finest, the most, the best, the advanced of technology of 2021 or 2022 now in their years. And they start walking up the aisles to figure out very quickly who is on the plane. They come on with really high-tech stuff. Piles of papers, this thick, <laughs> of 147 passengers. And they decided they're going to do this manually by pen. And they start from the first row asking, could you please take out your boarding pass? Could you please take... I said, she joking. She joking. There's 147 passengers. You know what it is to go through each seat with a boarding pass? Now, you know what happens when you get on a flight? You didn't expect anything to go wrong. Do you hold on, Bichlau, to your boarding pass? So people are starting to go through Bereshit bara Elohim. What did I do with my boarding pass? So they're jumping out of seats and everyone needs to be seated. Because they're not going to continue till everyone's seated. But how can I be seated if my boarding pass is in my hand luggage, which is on the above bin? So quickly they jump out by the seat, thinking that they're going to do this fast, without the store just looking, pull down the bin, rip down their hand luggage, hit the guy in front of them, and now the fights begin. Oh! This is unbelievable. Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. Ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, welcome to the greatest show on earth. And wow, was it a show. It took them an hour and a half to go through from the front of the plane to the back of the plane. You would think, use two people, let one guy start from the back come from. Let the one guy front come back. Let them meet somewhere in the middle. No, JetBlue, they have a mahalach. So they're giving out blue chips, thinking that that's going to do it, because we're already behind two, two hours on this flight, okay? We're supposed to leave at 1.30. It's already a quarter to three. And they're wondering, why are people losing their patience? Finally, they make it to the back of the plane, and somebody got upset at its stewardess. 
They grabbed the bag of peanuts out of anger and frustration of being cattled together for three hours, not being able to move, and some lady in the back of the plane threw it at the head of the stewardess. The stewardess got so upset. Unruly behavior. Unruly behavior. From a passenger? We will not stand that. She goes marching off the plane. I said, give out, please. Don't let happen what I think's about to happen. Sure enough, the manager comes walking on. We heard that there's a lady on this plane, unruly behavior. She must get off the plane or the plane is not taking off. Who is she? I pointed to my wife. <laughs> he went to the back of the plane. He found the lady. You have to get off the plane. She says, no way, I'm not getting off the plane. You guys kept us here for hours. Uh, lady, we're going to bring on security. The minute he said the word security, 12 people unholstered their phones. <laughs> when he saw the video starting to roll, he said, oh, I can't bring on security. It's not going to look good on the clips that are going to come out on that night's news. So he got up and he announced, everyone must deplane. We looked at him. We said, you're joking. We've been here three hours. Everyone got off the plane. The wheelchairs came. They picked up the old people, brought them off the plane. It's already almost 5 o'clock. The plane was supposed to leave at 1.30. I'm supposed to speak in Safra at 8.30. Give out. It just went on and and I'm thinking to myself, my wife is saying, but you gotta speak tonight. And I said, I know. Ah, Abba, you give out. Look what you're doing. You're showing me that this trip is going to be something special. And you want to see. Do we believe in the mirage? Or do we believe in the one that's real deal? Like my mother once told me, why are you wasting your time with the cashier? Go straight to the manager. Why are we wasting our time with the cashiers? You think it's this guy? You think it's Jet Blue? You think it's the lady that beamed her with the peanut bag? Go to the manager. Abishta, you want me to fight for this trip? There must be something big going down. And here it is, I walked in tonight, and I'm thinking to myself, wow. This is a kolev. Ashrechem, the toblach. Rabbi Yishlam should bench the kolev with a tremendous amount of siyata dishmaya vaiter. You should be zoicha to be toem the tam ha'amiti v'hamitikut shel Torah. Because the moment you taste that, everything else in this world is artificial flavor. And it's with that that I want to open up with an idea tonight. They told me, speak inspiration, but talk about tired. Okay? Abish to give me the right words. Ve'evor alaich ve'erech mitboseset bedamayich omalach bedamayich hai. The omalach bedamayich hai. Wow, what a night. The night of Yisiat Mitzrayim. The night that Bore Olam says. I'll never forget. I'll never forget the dam. The dam mila. I'll never forget the dam. The dam of Pesach. I'll never forget this night. Says Borei Olam, listen to these words. You remember this from the Haggadah of Pesach. Ve'at... Erom ve'eria. Says the Ariza. What do the words Erom ve'eria to refer to when talking about Klaus for the night of Yitziat Mitzrayim? And answers the Ariza. It's from here that we know that we were so empty, we were so desolate, we had nothing covering us, that we were on Mem Pet Sha'are Tumah. We were on the lowest of the low, and that's why. We couldn't hang around, not even an extra second, because another moment, we could have fell into the noon, like everybody knows. And this is what we were told as grown. And therefore, that night, we had to get out really fast. 
so fast that we couldn't even bake a matzah. It had to be run down with the masa on our shoulders. And at that moment of haste, says Borei Olam, I had to get you out so quick. Because another minute you could have fell to the abyss, to a point of no return. You could have fell to the Shar Nun of Tum'ah and Has Shalom. The point of no return, it would have been all over. Says the Ariza, Be'at, Erom Ve'eria, Men Tepsha'are Tum'ah. Aval ma na'aseh, ma na'aseh, Rabotai, ma na'aseh. Many of the great Sfarim HaKdoshim, the Siach HaSadeh, the Siach Yitzchak, they all ask a famous theorem. Because in Tanit Be'eliyahu, we find an amazing Midrash about Hahu Zaken, which we know Api Kabbalah is always referring to Eliyahu Navi, where some Rav met the Zaken Eliyahu Navi, and he asked Eliyahu Navi, tell me about the Yotze Mitzrayim. Eliyahu Navi answered that there was never a generation in Klal Yisrael's history that was as great as the Yotze Mitzrayim. And if this is the case, make up your mind. On one hand, you're telling me they were Erom the area. They were so naked and empty, they were on 49 levels of Tum'ah. And on the other hand, Eliyahu Navi tells me that there was no greater regeneration as the Yotze Mitzrayim. Make up your mind. Were they the lowest of the low? Or were they the highest of the high? An open stira. Answers the Baal HaLeshem. The Baal HaLeshem was the great-grandfather of none other than Rebel Yashiv, Zechit Tzadik Lebracha. The Baal HaLeshem had one hand that was paralyzed. And when the Baal HaLeshem wrote Kabbalah, his son-in-law, Rav Arya Levine, Zechit Tzadik Lebracha, was made that when it came time for him to write his Svarim, the Vrei Kabbalah, he wrote with his paralyzed hand. And the pen went down the page so quickly that you couldn't even see it move. And therefore, most of the works of the Baal is really beyond the scope of Moshe Urim, and specifically, And if that's the case, Rabotai, let me just share an idea of unbelievable, revolutionary Hidush of the Baal HaLeshem to fa'enfer this stira between the Mentet Sha'are Tumah or the Mentet of Sha'are Kiddusha on the most unbelievable night that this Shabbat we're representing, we're reading about Yisiat Mitzrayim. Which one was it? Says the Baal HaLeshem. Amazing idea. We talk a lot about the Zroa Nutuya. We talk about the Otot. We talk about the Moftim. But there's one word that not much gets spoken of. And that is umora gadol. What does it mean, umora gadol? It was this divine revelation. What's this mora gadol? Says the Balagada. Umora gadol. Zu gilui shchina. There was a gilui shchina the night of Yitziat Mitzrayim. Please break that down for me. What does that mean? That means that the night of Yitziat Mitzrayim, Borei Olam, Bichvodo Ba'atzmo, came down to Mitzrayim, the most decrepit of the decrepit or morale places on earth. Borei Olam, Ani Velo Malach, Ani Velo Saraf, Ani Velo Shaliach, Ani Ani Hu Velo Acher. I came down to you the night of Yitziat Mitzrayim when you were wallowing in the midst of the Zevel. I came down to you in Mitzrayim, literally in the dung, the capital of Tum'ah. I could have sent any of the Srafim, any of the angels. And says Borei Olam, no, no. Says the Midrash that the angels said, Borei Olam, you need to go down to Mitzrayim. Let us do it for you. We'll go down. We'll do Makat Bechorot. We'll wipe out the Egyptians. Berega hat. You need a dirty your hands can be a hole with the last Makat. You need this. Abba. You need this. You know what Borei Olam answers, says the Midrash? This is personal. Banayhem. These are my children. And what they did for 210 years, how they whipped them in the tar pits. Anochi imcha batsara. I felt every lash. I felt every whipping. 
I felt the cries and the pain of Klal Yisrael. And now as an Abba, I'm coming back to exact punishment. No, no, nobody else. I'm doing this myself. Ani velo malach. Ani velo saraf. Ani velo shaliach. Ani hu velo acher. Bore olam kiviachol. Could you imagine? The Shechina HaGdosha comes down itself. The Eibishta Alein comes down to a Mitzrayim, the capital of the Tum'ah of the world. In the midst of the Zevel, marinating there in the Tum'ah of the Dung. Could you imagine such a thing? And why did he come down to the lowest of the low? For me, for you. For me, for you. And at that moment... There was such a gilui shechina in Mitzrayim, they didn't know what to do with it. And suddenly, Klal Yisrael says the Baal Hashem, they went from Mem Tet Sha'are Tum'ah to this unbelievable leap of Madregot, of Mem Tet Sha'are Kedusha in one moment. Because we stood and basked in the shechina of Bore Olam. Ma mikveh mitaheret at me'im. Af HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Mitaher Yisrael. Did you ever see what a mikveh looks like? On the side is a bor that nobody knows about. That little bor of Arba'im Se'av rainwater is attached to a pool that's much larger, has all different types of chemicals, and was poured by man. It's water that's not kosher. But because it's connected to the mikveh, all of a sudden, the big bottle, the big area, of the tub of water becomes Kadosh Vitahor. You know why? Because it's connected to the Abba. And the minute you connect it to the Abba, Ma mikveh mitaheret atimeim, Afa Kodesh Baruch Hu mitaheret Yisrael. And that night, Yitziat Mitzrayim, there was such a mora gadol, there was such a gilui shechina at the moment that Borei Olam came down himself, that Klal Yisrael connected again to Abba, and we were mitaher in a split second. We leaped and jumped from the lowest of the low, from Memtet Sha'are Tum'ah to Memtet Sha'are Kiddusha in a second. And we walked out that night on the highest madrega of Klal Yisrael in history. And the mail, there's no steer at all. In the beginning of the night, we started Taka at Erom Veria. We really did start Memte Chare Tum'ah. But then Abba came down to town to bring us home. And at that moment, with the amazing Shekhinah, we jumped to Memtet Sha'are Kedusha and we walked out the greatest people. Rabotai, that was a freebie. It was a freebie. It was an act of unbelievable love. Because at the end of the Pasuk it says that Borei Olam tells Klal Yisrael in the Navi, listen to these words, if these words don't move you to tears, then go back and check your heart. Ve'e'evor alaych. That night I came out and down and I came over you. I passed over you. Ve'er'ech. And I saw you, Klal Yisrael, you were in the lowest of the low. Ve'hine itech et dodin. It was a moment of a tremendous love. Ve'efros knafai alaych. I covered you, I put my cloak over you, I covered you with my wing, with my cloak kivyachol. Ve'achase ervatech, I covered your erva. Ve'eshavelach, and I swore to you. Ve'avo bibrit otach, and I came to you with a confident nu'um Hashem Elohim. And the last two words, v'tehi li. I engaged you that night, the night that you were in the lowest. At the time that you were mamish in the men tetshade tuma. Not when you're the most beautiful. Not when you're all spitzed up. No, no. That's not when I came to ask you for your hand in marriage. That's not when it was. 
it was when you were in the schmutz. To let you know what I feel about Eid. It doesn't matter where he is. It doesn't matter how low he is. It doesn't matter where he's holding. Hare at mikudeshet li. Vatehi li. That's the end of the pasuk. Says the Balaturim, that night, Bore Olam, was Mikadesh Klal Yisrael with all three Kinyanim of the first Mishnah of Mesechet Kiddushim. He was Kaina us that night. He was Mikadesh us that night with Kesef, Shtar, and Bia. Vahamevin Yavi. We came out with such a wealth. We came to the Kitubab Klal Yisrael, the Torah itself, the Shtar. And this was a moment of mamish, a yichud with Hashem, that was compared to something so pure. At the moment of our lowest, it was Mekadosh. He picked us up when we had no schuyot, and he brought us up to the highest level, and it was pushed an act of love from the Eivishter. And that's the way we walked out, on the highest level, on a night of a gift. It was a freebie. Because the next day, we started back down from level ground zero. And now the Ebishter says, you see what it is to be on Memtet Share Kiddusha? Do you see what it means to be Davuk Bashem? With such a relationship, with such a love, with such a height. Do you see? You tasted it. Ta'amur u kitov. You tasted it? Now that you see what it means to be a memtet share kiddusha, now I gave you a matana, you tasted it, now I'm taking it back, start over from the bottom, and this time work for it. Work for it. Earn it. Because now, for the next 49 days, the days of Sfirata Omer, you're going to start being kone, the madregot, one day at a time until comes Matan Torah, you're going to come back up to Memtet, Share Kedusha, but this time you're a master of your own success. It's not Nahama de Kasufa. No, this is not a handout. This is not a Matanam. No, this time you earned it. I gave you a freebie to taste it. Now that you know what it means, now I take it back, go out, and make it real. Make it yours. Make it happen. Fight for it. Bring out the fighter. Show me you want it. Fight for it, and I'll help you get it. Vizuhi darkashel Torah. Vizuhi darkashel Torah. I run a night seder back in Brooklyn with Lebanese and Syrian boys. I started with them 20 years ago when they were in 11th grade. They got married. We put their kids into yeshiva. After that, their kids and their friends came back. We started another program. We have children. We have today high school. We have 150 families. The Abish is a Rachman. We have a night seder of 100 guys coming to learn every night when their friends are everywhere else. And they're loving it. You know how many times I'm sitting by the table giving shear at night and a kid comes in for the first time. He never learned in a night seder before. Hardly learned Gemara in high school. He sits down and out of the blue, he asks Rabbi Kiva Eger's kasha. And everybody else on the table looks at this kid and says, beginner's luck. Beginner's luck. I'm sitting here for years, schwitzing with the rabbi, learning, becoming a real ben Torah. This kid walks in from some sort of a cash advance business, doesn't know a clue about learning, sits down at the table. I thought he'd sell me a warranty. Instead, he looks into Tosafot. The rabbi tells the pshat, and this kid from all people on the table asks for Rabbi Kiva Eger's kasha and the rabbi falls off the chair and the rabbi rubs his eyes, pinches the kid to make sure he's real and then says, do you know whose kasha you just asked? You just asked for Kiva Eger's kasha and the kid looks at you and says, who's Rabbi Akiva Eger? And I said, that's, that's exactly my point. Who is Rabbi Akiva Eger? That's my point. And everybody in the table is blown away and they say, Rabbi, how does that make sense? Beginner's luck? And I said, no, that's the Balalashem. That's the Balalashem. That's the freebie because Abba loves you. And he gives it to you, the matana, taste it, love it, enjoy it. And now he takes it back. The next night, he's not asking Rikki Vegas Kasha. 
But the next night he's working on Tysus. And the next night he's working on his Lane Sigamar. Because now the present was taken back. And now he's going to have to go up the 49 levels, Svirata Omer, one day at a time, but for real, be kind of it and make it yours. So here's the close. My father was one of those 17 boys that was brought over by Rabbi Ron Kamenovich in 1950 to the Mir Yeshiva at the age of 13 years old. Rabbi Ron Kamenovich saw what the Alliance was doing to the youth of Morocco. My father came from a very Rabbanisha family. My great grandfather, the one I'm named after, was the Abedin of Casablanca. His father, Rabbi Avram Ben Shushan, came from Dibdo. He was from the three Avrams, that the whole country could only get smicha from three Abrahams in the entire country. He was one of them. And the children were barely, barely Shemir Shabbos. How do you explain that? <laughs> The father's a tzaddik, the grandfather's a mekubal. Today was Baba Salih's yard site, you know that. The father was a tzaddik, the grandfather mekubal, and the children are not Shreem and Shabbos. That was the alliance. The alliance was like the story of Hanukkah. Haman was the Nazis. Hanukkah was the alliance. We're not here to kill you. We want you to be a Jew, but you'll be a French Jew. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Don't be old-fashioned. We're going to make you cultured. We're going to make you European. You can be a Jew. Just don't be such an oi, oi, oi. And because of that, they wiped out the youth and the Jewry of Klal Yisrael. Grandfathers, great-grandfathers, tzaddikim, kedoshim, grandchildren, hardly shreim Shabbos. Rabbi Avron Kamenovich saw what was going on. Rabbi Avron Kamenovich went to Morocco, six foot three, long white beard, when he was walking through the streets of Essoera, all the old ladies in Morocco thought he was Elio Anavi. That night they all had dreams of Elio Anavi. Oh, everyone had a dream. I saw Elio Anavi. You know Moroccan grandmothers? That was very funny. But the point here is, he went to Morocco and he got a group of boys, brought them back to America, Beautiful story, but not for tonight. My father, miraculously, knowing nothing, was one of them that came with him. My father grew up in the Mary Shiva. No parents, 13 years old. It was time for him to get married. The yeshiva walked him down the aisle. You know, it was an unterfera. Remendel Zaks and the Rebbitson, the daughter of the Chappetz Chaim. That's who walked my father down the aisle. Because he didn't have parents. Nobody was here. He came at 13. He got married at 23 with nobody. But he was here because he was ready to fight to keep Tyra in our family. He had six other brothers, and they were all very successful. One is an uh, eye surgeon in Luxembourg, and another one's an ambassador in Paris, and a third one is also some sort of a doctor somewhere in Strasbourg. They're all very successful, and they see the inside of a shul twice a year, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. But my father was a fighter. He wanted to learn Tyra. And he came to the United States with nothing. So let me tell you the end of the story. My father was brought to the hospital in New York City to do a very simple routine procedure on his leg due to diabetes to clean the stent in his leg. No, I'm not saying that story. I've been doing this for years. <laughs> I already understand where, where you're going, and I want to show you where I'm going. He, he, had, he had a clogged stent in his leg. Simple procedure. The doctor told him, we're just going to clean the stent, local anesthesia. It will be over in an hour. It's, not, it's nothing. My father went in. They opened up his leg, local anesthesia. All of a sudden, something went wrong. As they were sending up whatever it was through his leg to clean the stent, they hit an artery and he began to bleed and has shalom, he was at a position that he might have bled to death. Quickly, the doctor pushes my father on his back, takes something off the shelf, puts it under his tongue and tells him, Mr. Ben Susan, if you don't want to die, take this fast, we need to operate. My father was like, What's going on? It's like you went in for a routine little nothing and it turned out to be this whole pikuach nefesh. 
So my father listened under stress, and they put something under his tongue. He was out in a moment. They did an operation. They stopped Baruch Hashem, the bleeding. But when my father woke up, little did he know that he suffered from a mini stroke due to the operation and its failure. He woke up and he couldn't see. He lost his vision. He could not see. He saw very barely, just like, like right in front of him, but his whole peripheral vision, nothing. He couldn't see anything. I remember they brought him back home to Lakewood. At that time, they already moved. My father goes to the Kolel on the outside of Westgate. He's the rough now of the shul, the Moroccan shul over there. He goes to the Kolel during the week. And my father turns to my mother and says, I can't see. How am I going to learn? I waited my whole life to be able to learn in my retirement. I told Edi Eivishta, I told Bore Olam, I, I just want to go back to learning. I just want to go back to learning. I just want to go back to learning. Here it is. I'm in the middle of my years of learning. I can't see. How am I going to learn now? I can't see the page. It was the first day of this month. It was 2 o'clock in the afternoon, Ben Asdurim. I called my mother. I said, Ma, Abba was probably very depressed today. He couldn't go to learn. She said to, she said to me, Are you joking? You know how stubborn your father is? I said, This is not about being stubborn. You can't see. You can't see. This is not about being stubborn. If you can't see, you can't see. You know, but he can't see. He can't see. She says, yeah, I know. And right after breakfast, I went into the back room for a minute. I come back out and I see your father is feeling against the walls, making his way to the front door, finds the front closet, puts on his jacket, puts on his coat, finds his hat, puts on his hat, and he starts feeling to the front door. He's jiggling the door handle to get it open, and that's when I walk up and I say, Yitzchak, what are you doing? And your father tells me he's going to Kailu. I said, Yitzchak, you can't see anything. How are you going to learn? You can't see the page. It's okay, Hashem will understand. Sit back and, and, and take a few weeks off and rest, and you'll go back to learning eventually when your sight comes back. What are you doing? Your father told me he's going to learn, and that's it. So I let him go on. Here, Dovi, I'll have him tell you the rest of what took place. She hands the phone to my father. I pick up the phone. I say, Abba, what were you thinking? And he says to me, listen to me. I made it to Kailu. It's the first day of this man, and we just started Baba Kama. He says, I sat down in my place. I took out my Gemara, thanks to my Chavrusa. I opened up the page and I looked down and I couldn't see a thing. It was a blur, a blur. He says, at that minute, I said, Eivishta, I want to learn. I want to learn. I'm begging you. Let me see something. Just, just give me something to learn. Give me something to learn. I made it here. I'm not leaving from this spot until I see something. Give me something to read. Let me see something. He says to me, Dovidal, listen to me. Just then, I looked down and I saw that there was an island of black in the middle of the page. There was some sort of a border of letters on the right. There was some sort of a border of letters on the left. I saw Atsuras Hadaf. I saw something. I said, thank you, Abba. Abba, I, I, I see Atsuras Hadaf. I see Atsuras Hadaf. Abba, thank you. I can see something, Mashu. It's a blur, but I can see the island. I can see the Rashi. I can see the Taisvis. I see something. Abba! Could you help me? Can I just read the Mishnah? Just the first Mishnah. Could you give me a word? Give me one word. Just give me one word word. He says, Dibbital, I look down and I'm looking and I'm saying, I'm not leaving from this spot until I can see the first word. And I looked at it and I looked at it again. I said, Abba, help! He says, I look down. He says, you're not going to believe me. I saw the first word. Arba. I said, Abba, thank you. You gave me one word. You gave me one word, Abba. You gave me a word. Can you give me another word? Give me one more word. Give me another word. Arba what? Arba what? Give me another word. I looked down and I saw the Avot. 
Oi! I saw the avot! I saw the avot! Papa, give me another word. I saw the nizikin, and just then I saw the shore, I saw the boar, I saw the mave, I saw the hever. From that point, I was able to go to the next line. In 10 minutes, I finished the Mishnah, and I fought for every word. I fought for it, because I want it. He says, two and a half hours later, Shaida was over. And he was able to finish the Amud with Rashi and Taisus. And I thanked Abba. Because I realized that everything he gave me till now was a freebie. Yeah. <clears throat> and then when he took it back, he wanted to see, are you ready to fight for it? Are you ready to fight for every single word? Thank you for listening. Uh, yeah.